asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Our, um, our first guest is obviously no stranger to you. He graces us with his presence once a month on this programme. He's got the coolest resume of all time as well, working in Hollywood, working at NASA. These days, though, he's the owner-operator of a terrific news outlet called WhatReallyHappened.com. And if you check it out, if you haven't before, I'm sure you have, you will find the What Really Happened radio show there as well. It's essential listening, balanced, fair and um, objective, completely untainted information put out there every day by Michael Rivero, who's live in Oahu in Hawaii. It's early in the AM there. Mike, welcome back. Thanks for coming on. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Thank you for having me back again. You know, Mike, when John Bolton was announced last week as Trump's national security advisor, because you and I have known each other now since my Spain days, of course I thought of you straight away. And I thought, what will Rivero make of this? What does Rivero make of this? What's going on, Mike? What, what's going on that this lunatic well, neocon madman who wants to bomb every country that he's never visited, by the way, how is he back in the White House? It's obvious the neocons are back in power. I'm fully in agreement with former President Jimmy Carter, who was saying this is the worst mistake Donald Trump has made so far in his term as president. And yeah, it, it does look like uh, slowly but surely uh, Donald Trump is assembling a war cabinet. Uh, this does not bode well for the United States of America. Uh, we're seeing this incredible push toward major war confrontations with uh, Russia and China. And uh, the U.S. is doing sort of OK against uh, nations with lesser militaries. But we're still mired in Afghanistan. We're still having to garrison Iraq. Uh, we've been in Syria now for seven years uh, and, and it looks like the U.S. is going to just haul off and attack Damascus now that ISIS is gone. Uh, but up against a peer nation like Russia or China, I don't think the U.S. can prevail conventionally. And that means we're looking at a real possibility of a nuclear exchange down the road. Mike, I want to talk about ISIS being gone in a <coughs> second. Before we do that, you said there that the U.S. is mired in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And I wouldn't argue with you. You're right. But if I look at a map of the world now, and I imagine it as a chessboard, Michael. The US has got the world in a kind of a checkmate position because it's got military bases pretty much everywhere. I'm sure there's one outside my back uh, door, Mike, uh, you know, not to be uh, churlish about it, but they've got bases everywhere. Isn't it in a great position? Well, it depends on uh, how much those bases can project power. Most of those, uh, I think it's nearly 800 bases, are very small installations. Uh, but yes, the U.S. is garrisoning the world the way the Roman Empire tried to garrison their empire. Uh, but at some point, uh, if it suffers a major defeat anywhere, uh, you're going to start to see that crumble the same way that Rome uh, started to crumble after it lost its three legions in Germany. Back to ISIS now in Syria, and we'll talk about Iran as well. And I, my thoughts when I saw Bolton coming in were aligned with yours. I, I penned a little article for my own website, basically suggesting that war might be imminent, bringing the likes of this clown in. And we don't... All right, well, I'm a bit of an idiot. I do use these types of terms, and maybe I shouldn't use them. But but, but we're talking about maniacs in, in Bolton. How, how far... How far in retreat is the Islamic State, Michael? How, how, how much of it is left? Well, you have to remember that the Islamic State in Syria was a U.S. proxy force. And uh, uh, back when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, they were covertly arming and funding both al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria uh, as a proxy force to overthrow uh, Assad. But they've failed miserably. Russia has come on in and uh, basically uh, just hammered them. And now the remaining ISIS uh, militant forces uh, are accepting an offer of amnesty from the Syrian government. They're surrendering their arms uh, and they're taking their families and they're leaving. So the U.S. is left without that false front proxy to go against Assad. And that's why it looks like the U.S. is getting ready to mount just a direct major assault against Syria itself. All that's lacking is a pretext, and because they're not getting any traction with the claims that Assad is gassing his people, 
because they've been caught lying about it so many times before. I'm very, very concerned that there's going to be some kind of a major false flag with chemical weapons on the United States itself to say Assad has attacked us and we have to go to war uh, against Syria. You know, it's interesting you say that, Michael, because when Bolton was announced, I started looking at some of the things that Bolton has been talking about in the last year or, or 18 months, because you, Michael will know, of course, based where he is, Bolton has been a pretty regular talking head on one or two stations for, for a long time. Uh, one of the things Bolton has claimed, and it's absolutely spurious, is this idea that North Korea were posting or, or, or sending by freight or, or one way or another the components of chemical weapons to the Assad government. And Michael, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, you know, you have your sources. That's just nonsense, Michael. There's no evidence to support that, is there? No, of course there isn't. Uh, this is just pure war propaganda. Yeah. They're trying to find any lie that will actually resonate with the American people to support uh, the U.S. government's military agenda. But the American people are war weary. We've been at war for something like 18 years now. We've been in Afghanistan longer than World War One and World War Two put together. And the American people are just fed up with it. They don't want any more war. They, they're tired of paying the cost of war. Uh, they're tired of living in a war economy. They're tired of their children coming back either killed or crippled from the war zones. Uh, and they understand there's no real reason other than U.S. imperialism and corporate greed for any of these conflicts to be happening. None of these countries the U.S. government has attacked has done anything wrong to us other than be an economic threat. When Russia stepped in to support Assad's government, doing the only thing they could do, the right thing for them and the right thing for everybody else, you said at the time, you, you, you speculated that things would go like this, the way it's turning out now. And today, the Russian foreign minister, the, the minister of foreign affairs, I should call him, Sergei Lavrov, he's, and the Russians have been pretty cool over the last three years, four years, as all of these nonsense claims have been made about Russia. They've kept their cool, admirably, I would have said. But yes. today, but today, Mike, Lavrov is um, cheesed off. Obviously, Putin is cheesed off. And they're starting to ramp up the rhetoric, starting to use some very strong adjectives of their own to describe the UK and the United States of America. Is that cause for concern, Michael, or is it just that they're so irritated now they're firing back? It's obviously a cause for concern because when the rhetoric starts escalating, it's a bad sign. Uh, it, it means that we're closer to actual conflict than we were before. Uh, but I can understand why Russia uh, has reached uh, the limit of their patience. Uh, they can see clearly that the goal of the United States is to goad Russia into some kind of an overt act that can be seized as a justification uh, to basically get into a, a real shooting war. And obviously, with American and Russian forces uh, very close together in Syria and the U.S. about to attack Damascus, uh, it, it does look like we're on the verge of World War III. Uh, and because the U.S., I don't think, can match uh, Russia and China, especially if they're combined together, there, again, there's a real possibility of an actual nuclear exchange. And of course, China's proximity, and I know we've got intelligent audiences, but just to double down on what Mike is saying, you know, China shares a border with Russia. It's not going to tolerate any notion that there might be a nuclear weapon heading towards eastern Russia. It's not going to tolerate that. And, no. and this is absolutely true. So this false flag scenario, something to happen in the US for it to be blamed on the Assad government. Michael, do you think that could be genuinely sold to an increasingly more sceptical American public? Do you really think? Because Assad... You know, regardless of what anybody thinks about what's happening in Syria, even if you get your information from the mainstream media, you know, it's not an easy sell that Assad would would sanction some dirty attack, some dirty bomb attack on an American city. They couldn't sell that, Mike, could they? No, that, well, it depends on the size of the attack. I mean, if it's just a small attack, people are going to say this is just the U.S. government doing what they did before, because the U.S. government has a long history of lying this nation into war. Uh, uh, there was no Spanish mine at Havana Harbor. Uh, there were no torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin. 
the Lusitania was in fact smuggling weapons to Great Britain. Uh, everybody remembers the story about Saddam's nukes uh, and the many times that claims about Assad gassing his own people have been proven to be lies. But a big enough attack that emotionally shocks everybody and makes everybody afraid uh, might actually succeed. Kind of like what 9-11 was. Kind of like what 9-11 was and we're back to Bolton again. So yes. Bolton has talked a lot in 2017, particularly late 2017, about the need to get rid of uh, the Ayatollah. Let's get rid of the Iranian revolution. Let's go back in time and let's get a revenge for that. So it's not coincidental then that he's appointed. At the moment in Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu has got all manner of problems with investigations into his conduct and alleged uh, corruption. He's desperate to launch some sort of preemptive strike on Iran and claim that he's doing so to stop Iran trying to acquire a nuclear weapon. It's like the stars are aligning, Michael. And it's like as much as Syria might be in the crosshairs, Iran might also be in the crosshairs this year. And also, it's worth pointing out, you talked about the Russian and Chinese capability to defend themselves. The Iranians are no idiots either, Michael. No, they're, they're, they're really not. Uh, they never were developing nuclear weapons, but they do have conventional weapons, and they've moved much closer to Russia. And Russia has already indicated that if Iran is attacked, Russia will come to their aid. So we could see, at the very least, we're looking at a, a war across the entire Middle East to redraw the map. Uh, at the worst case, we're looking at this spiraling out of control and turning into a true global conflict. Michael Rivero is our guest. Do check out whatreallyhappened.com. If you haven't checked it out before, I'm sure you have. It's a website you should bookmark. Uh, you really should check it out and listen to Michael's daily radio program. There's not many like it. Mike Rivero is live in Oahu in Hawaii. Michael, I don't believe that whatever Cambridge Analytica did, that it had as much of an effect on the EU referendum and the US presidential election as maybe they might like to brag that it did. They, Their executives have bragged about doing this and doing that and doing the other thing. I believe people were predisposed to vote for Trump because of the, the filth, the filth of the Clinton crime family and people in the UK were sick to death of wages being driven down by migration. They weren't racist. They wanted to vote to leave the European Union anyway. Now, however, however, speaking to um, Neil Sanders, who's an expert on mind control and um, he, he's an author on the programme last night, he's done some research into some of the men who are involved with this Cambridge Analytica and how they've been involved in election campaigns in multiple other countries, whether they were successful or not. But we're talking serious military industrial complex espionage guys here, Mike. As I said, I don't believe they had any, you know, positive effect on the US election one way or another or Brexit. But are we kind of seeing with this Cambridge Analytica story just what the deep state is really capable of doing. That being said, I'm sure there were companies working for progressives and liberals doing the exact same thing. What have you made of this story, Mike? Well, there's absolutely no question the Democrats were taking advantage of Cambridge Analytica as much, but the media is putting the focus on their connection to Donald Trump and their connection to Brexit uh, to sort of delegitimize both of those election outcomes and say, well, it... Uh, it was all manipulated psychologically with all this data stolen from Facebook, and so you shouldn't take it too seriously. But the Democrats were definitely uh, uh, very much involved with uh, Cambridge Analytica. <clears throat> Pardon me. And what's coming on out now, there was a lot more to Cambridge Analytica than just uh, mining data and creating targeted advertising. Some of the executives at Cambridge Analytica are talking about how uh, they hired Israeli firms to yeah. hack into computers to get uh, uh, damaging information uh, uh, to, to basically e expose uh, the opponents to their clients. Uh, they were using sex workers to try and get information or to try and get people into compromising situations. So it went way beyond just the data leak aspect of it. Uh, they're basically election fixers uh, and they're willing to do pretty much anything to help their clients win. It's an interesting one, this, isn't it? Because you and I have spoken many times in the past about the dangers of living a life online and giving of yourself constantly online, sharing your life, your loves, your beliefs, your disbeliefs, sharing everything. It's out there, Michael. And if anybody believes that 
when Facebook says, ooh, if you tick this box, only your friends will see your posts. Well, Mike, they've got another think coming, don't they? People need to wake up to this. Yeah, absolutely. When you go onto any of the corporate social media, you have to ask yourself, why are these companies worth so much money? Why are these CEOs getting paid so much money? It's because they're harvesting the data and they're selling it to uh, online advertisers, marketing companies, uh, governments, anybody who's interested in having that uh, that data. Basically, everybody who's on Facebook has been creating their own dossier uh, for the U.S. government to keep tabs on them. And uh, you do need to be very, very careful. Now, parents do warn children about exposing private information online out of concern uh, for pedophiles. But everybody needs to understand that once you type that keyboard and it goes out there on the Internet, uh, it is fair game for anybody. And Zuckerberg, of course, was uh, saying all along that, no, your data is your data and only you and your friends can see it. And now we find out that they've been harvesting all that data and basically selling it uh, to anybody who was interested, including Cambridge Analytica. Absolutely right, Mike. Mike, before we talk briefly in, in the few minutes we have left about the anti-Semitism madness that's blown up here in the UK, which I know you've been following, before we do that, on the Trump thing, you and I have spoken a lot about Trump since he announced his candidacy. And the more I look at it now, Michael, the more I believe, and of course I'm very, I, I can't be anything other than honest. I have no proof of this. This is just a guess. But I've got a guess that, you know, Trump is as flawed he is as flawed or as virtuous as any other human being. Well, you know, we've all got our warts and all. And Donald has had a lot of money for many years. He's been around the old beauty pageants. I have to imagine, Michael, that Trump has made a couple of missteps over the years, like anybody else in his position. Intelligence has been gathered against him. And the real deep, deep, deep state didn't care. I'm not saying now that they fixed the election form. I'm not saying that at all. But they didn't care that he'd win, Mike, because no matter what he said or whatever he really believed while he was running, they knew that what you say when you're running and what you do when you're in are two different things because we've got, you know, we've got dirt on you. I can't believe they wouldn't have dirt on him. What do you think, Mike? Well, uh, again, in terms of uh, this whole Stormy Daniels, uh, the, the Stormy Daniels uh, issue, uh, statistically, half of all married people fool around uh, from time to time. Uh, so it's in my mind, it's not that big a deal. Uh, but uh, somehow or other, Trump has been brought into line with the deep state agenda, whether he's being blackmailed with uh, uh, damaging information, whether he's been directly threatened. Uh, you know, they could have taken him into a room and showed him Dealey Plaza, Dallas, Texas, November 22nd, 1963, and said, yeah. we could get away with it then. We can get away with it now. But, uh, you know, I supported Trump mostly because I didn't want Hillary to get on in. Uh, but he has been a tremendous disappointment, especially with his pledge to reduce these foreign military interventions. And instead, we're clearly going the other way. Hillary is still not in jail. Uh, he's not doing anything about election fraud. Uh, and, and that's an area where you would think he would be well motivated to clean up our election system, uh, because uh, if he doesn't, uh, you, uh, the Democrats are going to steal Congress in November and he's going to be a one-term president. Uh, but uh, he has been a disappointment and it does seem like he's assembling this war cabinet around him. Uh, and maybe, the, maybe the, the ego rush of being president has gone to his head and uh, he wants to go down in history as a major war president, but he could easily go down in history as the very last president of the United States of America. You're a rare breed, Michael, because, you, you know, you're honest and you'll call it as you see it. But what we see here, we're seeing in the United States, hardcore Trump supporters just can't bear to admit that maybe they were duped. And here in the UK, we're seeing it with progressives, liberals, whatever you want to call them, socialists, who can't believe they were duped by Jeremy Corbyn. Because what we've seen in the last couple of days, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, is that Jeremy Corbyn, the man who was going to come in and bring, bring, bring with him, he was going to right every wrong, he was going to get rid of the old cabal, he was going to jobs for everybody, he was going to, everything was going to come up with a rising tide. Now, of course, he hasn't been elected yet, but what he's done is reversed himself on everything, reversed himself on the European Union. But in the last couple of days, Michael, he's collapsed in front of the Zionist lobby in the UK 
over some spurious, bogus claims that anti-Semitism is everywhere, rather than meet it head on and say, well, this is garbage, you know, there's no more anti-Semitism than there is Islamophobia, and there's no more Islamophobia than, you know, than there is hatred of, of blacks. He's collapsed in front of them, Michael. And they're even talking today about re-educating every Labour councillor, every Labour member of Parliament. So that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people re-educating them on what anti-Semitism is. And one of the things they're going to do is is they're going to enshrine in law that you can't compare the behaviour of the State of Israel with the Nazis. That's going to become illegal. Like these are terrifying times, right? They absolutely are. And again, uh, Israel has uh, mutated the meaning of anti-Semitism uh, to blur the line between criticism of the actions of the government of Israel. And that, that's really what they're trying to do, is shut down criticism of what Israel is doing. Uh, anti-Semitism, of course, uh, is hating somebody just because they're Jewish, or to be very honest, uh, Arab. Uh, but that's not really what the issue is. The issue is the behavior of those individuals at the top of the Israeli government. And at least here in the United States of America under the First Amendment, we all have a right to criticize the actions of any government anywhere on planet Earth. Uh, but that's what Israel is trying to say. Oh, it's anti-Semitism. People only complain about the actions of Israel because they hate the Jewish people. Well, that's like trying to defend Nazism by saying, you're only complaining about Hitler because you hate the Germans. And is the response, because I know you have... You always have an eye on what's happening in the UK, but I'm also mindful of the fact that you're not here and you don't have half a dozen screens in front of you broadcasting national British news channels as I do every day. It's incredible, Michael, what's happening. You have members of Parliament coming on and are being shouted at by presenters of BBC news programmes, Channel 4 news programmes and so on. They're being shouted at as to... This is terrible. How could you not stop this? Why aren't you doing more? It is unbelievable. It's, it's, it, I haven't seen anything like this. And I'm thinking, there's got, I mean, you mentioned earlier on about Bolton coming in and the war footing. We, we, you and I don't believe the timing is coincidental. This must be timed to coincide with something that's going to happen this year, Michael. I agree. I agree. I think uh, uh, even by summer, we're going to be in a real global conflict. And uh, I'm, I'm, obviously, you and I are both very, very concerned about that uh, because uh, we're, we're talking millions, if not billions, dead. Folks, check out Mike at whatreallyhappened.com. If you haven't before, as I said earlier on, it's whatreallyhappened.com. Michael's program, uh, the What Really Happened radio show, is unmissable. Uh, do check it out. Uh, find Mike on Facebook as well and on Twitter. Great to catch up with you, Michael. Thanks for your patience with me. Uh, twice a year we have this, don't we, with this clock business. Yeah. <laughs> twice yes. a year. Yeah. And uh, it's been happening for years. I think if I ever got it right, you might start to wonder there's something going on. Uh, some sort of Stepford Richie Allen or something like that has been put in my place. Um, love chatting with you. Thanks for giving us your time, Michael, and your research. I appreciate that. Speak real soon, my friend. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for having me on the air again. Oh, it was brilliant. The great Michael Rivero live in Oahu, Hawaii this uh, this evening. We were talking, of course, about the clocks going forward two weeks ago stateside and it was two weeks later here. Not a week as I had thought. And I got the timings all messed up as I always do. Top man is Mike. Check him out. Whatreallyhappened.com. 